My name is Jennifer Hogan, and I am an environmental scientist for the California Department of Water Resources. I'm here this morning to talk to you about my, my experiences and my observations while involved with these maintenance activities where there's also this federally protected species, the California red-legged frog. I want to make it just obvious to you that I'm not going to be describing some kind of controlled experiment. I have recorded some very basic water quality parameter measurements, and I have written down every single California red-legged frog and egg mass I have ever encountered. But primarily, I'm going to just describe to you my job, and more importantly, the lessons learned while doing it. I'm going to discuss with you the issues due to working in water containing threatened and endangered species. Primarily, I'm going to discuss the permitting process that it took to get these projects underway. Also, I want to discuss the need to change the plans as we go. The buzzwords are, of course, adaptive management, but it was huge with all this. Also, for those of you who are maybe new to looking out um, for a particular species, I wanted to talk about searching for the frogs, habitat evaluation, maybe some biases and um, some prejudices when it comes to looking at habitat. And then lastly, I wanted to approach the question, are we negatively impact impacting the frogs? Give you an idea of where these projects take place. We are in Northern California, just on the east side of the San Francisco Bay Area, on the eastern side of the coastal range. And this, what I have highlighted here, is Department of Water Resources Delta Field Division region. And where the projects take place, excuse my uh, nervousness indicator here. Where'd it go? So here we go. The water comes from the delta and it's tidally fed into Clifton Court Four Bay. Then it gets pumped up into this little region right in here. That's Bethany Reservoir where it's stored for a little bit. And then water is sent down primarily through a pipeline but also open canal to Santa Clara Valley and then, of course, down the California Aqueduct to Southern California. This is also the Altamont Pass area. For those of you who are, who are familiar with that, there's some raptor issues going on in this area. Just give you an idea of what's going on, where we're at. This is the world in which I live, California Aqueduct, windmills, and California red-legged frogs. There are two types of drainages that we clear out on a yearly basis. Not every drainage is cleared out every year, but we have these maintenance activities that take place every year. This is at the base of Bethany Reservoir Dam. There are about four different dams associated with this reservoir, and they have these seeps that naturally flow from the dam out into this drainage, and the safety of dams inspectors go and monitor the flow from these dams to make sure that the integrity of the dam is still intact. Well, a bunch of vegetation and sediment build up in these areas where they cannot take their measurements. That's a big deal to them. So I was asked to get the permitting in place to clear out these ranges where there are California red-legged frogs, so primarily they can take their measurements. We use these giant excavators. They're giant to me. They're huge. I'm down in the water area and next to the big old bucket. The operator just scoops material out and then takes it up into a dump truck and dumps it. I'm primarily down in the water with um, like a radio headgear thing talking to the operator because so, he cannot always see me down there. And then there's another biologist in the dump truck making sure that we um, haven't accidentally put any frogs into the dump truck. So we have these you know, checks here. This is the other type of drainage here. We have a um, little concrete apron here and a weir, and then the drainage naturally flows on. Underneath here, underneath the aqueduct, is a big old culvert. This was designed when they built the aqueduct to allow the natural uh, tributaries that came down to keep on going uh, east into the Central Valley. So as you can see downstream here, a bunch of vegetation and cattails had built up. This is after one year's worth of work here. I'll get into more details of why we planted this way and what we've done. But this is just to give you an idea of what these drainages look like. This shows you one of the reasons why we need to do this so badly. Um, this is along the South Bay Aqueduct. 
the frog became listed in 1996, and all maintenance projects stopped where there was potential for frog or definitely were frogs. So over the time it took me to get the permits in place and actually get the work going, these culverts really built up with sediment in several of them. So I'm just giving you an idea of the importance of this. Because if the water doesn't flow through, it backs up against the aqueduct and it interferes with the integrity of it, and that's just you know, a bad thing according to the Department of Water Resources, and I'm sure you kind of have an idea of why that would be so. Moving on to lessons learned. For those of you who are not familiar with the permitting process, I wanted to give you an idea of, of what I did have to obtain here. I went through the Army Corps engineers and received a nationwide permit 3, 13, and 33. Went, of course, through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Sur Service. Got a biological opinion and a take permit through the Section 7 of the Endangered Species Act. Through fishing game, I got to 1601 programmatic, streambed alteration agreement, and then separately a, a handling permit. Regional Water Quality Control Board gave us a technically conditioned water quality certification, and of course, I wrote a mitigative neg negative declaration for CEQA compliance. Oops. Back up. All right. Well. He, during the consultation process, I didn't allow enough time, in my mind, for the, for the actual getting the permits in place. And here's just an example of that. No offense to any Fish and Wildlife Service people out there, but sometimes they go over their time limit of 150 days for issuing a biological opinion. Well, Army Corps finally initiated the formal consultation November 2000, and 559 days later, I received the biological opinion. Through this time, though, I was working with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biologists to come up with uh, avoidance and minimization measures for working with the frog. And this is what um, was put into the original biological opinion. We have a work window between August 1st and October 31st. It's the driest time of the year, and ideally the tadpoles will have metamorphosed into um, juvenile frogs by, by now. We were asked to do a maximum clearance of 50 feet per site per year. So by minimizing the amount of material removed, we're minimizing the impacts to the frogs and their habitat. We were asked to clear only one side at a time, leaving the other side with overhanging vegetation and over the created open water area. We were asked to meander the material removal every 50 feet. So over you know first year, 50 feet, second year, opposite side of the bank, and so eventually we'd have a meander going. We were asked to cut the vegetation down to about six inches above the surface, and I thought this was a brilliant idea because this allowed us to really be able to see the frogs that were hunkering down in that vegetation before the excavator bucket came in and removed the material. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then lastly, we were asked to place the captured frogs in size segregated coolers containing ice water. Size segregated, obviously big frogs eat the little frogs. And then ice water so that the frogs would slow down metabolism. So when we're opening up the cooler, adding more frogs, the other ones in there aren't hopping out and trying to close it and we don't want to injure the frogs that way. So you can imagine why this is a good idea. So coming into the adaptive management part of this, we learned in some drainages that 50 feet just simply wasn't enough. So much material had built up that, sure, we get the apron and 50 feet down, but that water's still going to pond up against the structure, which was a no-no for Department of Water Resources, and the whole purpose of trying to get this work done was to get the water to flow away from the structure. So after this first year of work, I acquired an amendment to the biological opinion that then allowed us to clear enough material down the way to allow the water to flow away from the structure and that's worked really, really well. It's kind of an indefinite amount, but we've learned in some cases we only have to go 35 feet, say, to allow the water to flow away. In other places we've had to go about 250 feet. Also, we were asked, of course, to cut the cattail down to about six inches off the ground. It only took one year for myself and my fellow you know, biologists to figure out that this is just hard work. It's back-breaking. It is not any fun. So we uh, got the, Army, the California Conservation Corps members to do the work. One of the more brilliant ideas that came out of this whole thing. Also, 
This is back to the, the Bethany Dam area. We call this Bethany Seep 3. We um, lease the land for grazing. So there are cows there, okay. Well, they want water. The drainage has water. So they get down in there and they really muck it up. Well, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I found that in this particular drainage, historically red-legged frogs lay their eggs here. And I was going out doing egg mass surveys and I saw that in a puddle created from a cow stomping in there, there was, you know, red-legged frog egg mass. And so I thought, oh wow, cows are providing habitat for breeding, cool. Well, I went back the next week to check on things and of course the cows had gotten back in there and it squished the egg mass among other things. So I said, well, that's not cool. So we built an exclusion fence around this area to keep the cows out from where they were breeding. One of the sadder parts of this lessons learned is dealing with the tadpoles. I now know that tadpoles do very well in cool water with an aerator. Well, going in here for the first time and, and first time coming across tadpoles, I put them in the ice water with the metamorphosed frogs, which did very, very well, but the tadpoles ended up dying by the end of the day. And so I went right out to the nearest pet shop, got an aerator, and changed that for the next day. And it works perfectly. Another site we came across about 100 red legged frog tadpoles, had them in the water with the aerator, and they lasted all day, and it was, it was a really good thing. Continuing on, continuing on with that sad part of this, is this is the same drainage where I found those original three tadpoles. In, this is our exclusion fence, once again. It took us a whole, like, 10 hours to do half of this drainage in this one day. And so, of course, the next day we were coming back to finish it up. What I did not anticipate was that the hole we created from moving the material here drew all the water into it, all right? It created like a little swimming pool, if you will, and left a lot of this area high and dry overnight. Ended up finding about 35 tadpoles that had um, desiccated and then died. There were another 25 tadpoles that we were able to um, save and they got released and, and appeared to do quite well, but there were those 35 tadpoles that didn't make it. So now, anytime there's a possibility that we'd be stranding any kind of tadpoles, we go out in the middle of the night and check to see if there's any tadpoles even close to getting that. I haven't found any sense, but if we do, we'll, if we do we'll just move them into the, the deeper area. Um, Oh, I, I do want you to know that I've been working with Fish and Wildlife Service agent this entire time. They knew every step of the way about the mortalities, and, um, and it was built into our biological opinion that there could potentially be mortality in it. So we're all in the up and up as far as that goes, but it just, it just killed me to know that I was killing these tadpoles. Had to change. For those of you kind of new to habitat evaluation, I just wanted to point out to you that sometimes what doesn't look good to us is actually okay for the frog. I have to admit, I got to this drainage when I was doing some of my very initial surveys for the frogs, that it was the end of the day, I was tired, and I saw this trashed area, and I just went, oh, there's not gonna be a frog here. Well, it turns out that there were at least a dozen kind of hanging out in this grassy area when we first walked down. And then right behind me from where this picture is taken is an eight foot in diameter culvert that goes underneath the aqueduct and goes downstream. And in that culvert, there was like another dozen adult frogs just in the puddled area in there. So just because it looks bad to us doesn't mean it's bad for the frog. And I cleaned up this garbage, by the way. And then the dump that was allowing all this plastic to blow our way has since put a fence up to prevent this from coming into the drainage. Also, don't judge the habitat by the weeds either. This is along the South Bay Aqueduct. We were cleaning this stretch out here. There were two little ponded areas within here, and we found two adult California red-legged frogs while we were cleaning out this area. So you may look at that and go, that's not red-legged frog habitat. Well, it quite possibly is. So we come to the, the final question, really. Are these maintenance activities impacting the frogs. Well, what I have discovered is where there was not any breeding habitat before because of the high amount of sediment, the water was flowing to a certain degree, but there was no ponded areas, and it certainly wasn't deep enough. By 
moving the material out of the drainage, we have created deep enough water for frogs to breed. So we have been finding them where we had never before. An example, this is that Bethany Seep 3 area. This is the downstream end of that exclusion fence. This is just, you know, narrow little drainage here where it was packed in with cattails and high in sediment. Certainly no breeding habitat prior, but we just cleaned out. Just, this is the 35 feet here, just enough to get the water flowing and clean out that culvert right there. The next breeding season, just, you know, five months later, we found seven California red-legged frog egg masses in just this little area. A little further down, this is Bethany Seep 2, um, where you saw us cutting the cattails that first year, that little bit of cattails. This is just downstream of that. You have you just dirt during the summer. It's all dried up here. This is wet right here because we cleaned out the area and poured water in here to make sure that we were doing the job of getting the water to go out that little culvert at the end. But with the, you know, the crude way with the excavator and all that, we, there was uneven, unevenness in this. So we created some ponded areas in the wintertime and just, you know, attached to this weed here with this brassica niger, I think. Red-legged frog egg mass here, another one over here you can kind of see. And if you look closely, there's a bunch of Pacific tree frog egg masses. So this seemingly ugly drainage right over here turns into this little amphibian nursery in the summertime, or in the springtime, rather. Another drainage, this is the one where 50 feet just wasn't enough. It took, um, the following year we cleaned out about another 200 feet and um, it took three breeding seasons before we started to see red leg frog egg masses here. But I found five here this past, last year, not this year. And then just a little down the way here, South Bay Aqueduct, this is looking upstream to where the apron is. We cleaned about 250 feet here the following breeding season, we came across 11. California red legged frog egg masses. So I have a reason to smile. The, the safety of dams, people can take their measurements along the dam. The civil maintenance people of DWR are happy because the water's flowing away from their structures. And I can't say that we're creating, uh, that we're making more frogs because these frogs might have gone somewhere else to do their breeding. That's where this, you know, this non-controlled experiment thing comes in. But I do know that we are opening up habitat that wasn't there before and the, the frogs are taking advantage of it. So just need to thank those other biologists that helped me do this work. I can no way do this on my own. And I imagine that there's some questions. And he asked about the mosquito fish in one of the tadpole in the cooler pictures and what do we do about invasive species. We destroy the invasive species as we catch them. That includes bullfrogs. We don't have bullfrogs along the California aqueduct drainages, but along the South Bay aqueduct ones we do. And we do work every year there where we drain down the, the drainage in our area and take out any tadpoles, the bullfrog tadpoles that we find, and we find usually juveniles um, and rarely an adult. There's a, a source upstream of that of a golf course. So every year more tadpoles get washed down and we have more juveniles that find our way. So when we do the work to clean out the material, we also, like I said, take the, the water down and take out all those invasive species and, and take care of them accordingly.